I was popular in middle school, but not in the way you think. At my school, the popular girls played volleyball, and so did I. So I thought they were my friends. <laughs> Silly me. Last time I checked, your friends aren't supposed to make fun of your body and set you up with guys as a joke. Yeah, they did that. I barely got invited to anything, but when I did, they would just make fun of me the whole time. One time, I don't like talking about this because it bothers me so much. A girl put me in a chokehold, and they locked me in a room after. Yeah. The psychological explanation for every Everything they did to me is that they were insecure. If anything, the situation taught me that it's better to be alone than to be surrounded by people who treat you like garbage. It gets better. Not for the bullies, though. Let's talk about the girl best friend. The girl who knows him best. My first ex-boyfriend had a girl best friend, and I was like, oh, you know, I don't really know if she should be talking to you like that. And he always gaslit me into thinking that there was nothing going on. And then the day we broke up, he told me that they had been talking for our entire relationship. But nothing tops my sixth ex-boyfriend's girl best friend this girl got me good i had never experienced a girl best friend who actually wanted to be friends with me so i really really liked her until she home wrecked my relationship now i'm pretty sure my ex would tell her all of our problems so i mean she was probably taking notes as to how she could infiltrate the relationship for months <laughs> One day, he went over to her house to see her family, and they went to a gas station together alone to get orange juice and chocolate. Ended up sitting in the parking lot for an abnormally long amount of time. And then the day after that, he called me her name while we were talking. And wouldn't you know it, after we broke up, they started dating. So you think you can trust the girl best friend? You cannot. And if you're a girl best friend who acts like this, just date him already. In every relationship I've been in, my friends have told me to dump my boyfriend. I never listen and I really should have. Believe it or not, your friends know you pretty freaking well. They basically witness every stage of your relationship. You know, there's like the honeymoon stage where you're super happy and they're really supportive, but then the minute that's over, they will be able to tell if things are going south. When you start complaining to them that your relationship sucks and everything's going downhill, and they politely suggest, have you ever thought of maybe breaking up with him? Say yes and do it. Overall, listen to your freaking friends. There's a story time that I cannot believe I've never told you in Strappin because it's it's good you can remember i did a story time on the worst breakup i ever had and if you can't remember just know this guy literally sucked <laughs> like sucked like sucked like terrible at the end of that story time i kind of mentioned that he had cheated on me with his ex-girlfriend he's hanging out with her going to local parks together getting lunch this girl knew i existed because like we posted each other come on okay nice cool awesome anyway like i was saying we post each other so she knew i existed a young emily was a messy emily okay let me tell you she wasn't very mentally stable right she was a little bit messy it was around the fourth of july so you know we all go to this one town park we crack them firecrackers don't crack them on me where the police at he was throwing this big party and i knew she was gonna be there so i was like it's time for me to go to this party i was under the influence of alcohol i won't lie i was a little bit cranked on the way to this said party we end up seeing mary me and my friends and we're like omg that's mary my messy ass decides to walk up to her and like I don't know who she is and start telling her she's pretty and like talking with her like we're gonna be friends I end up liking her I was like damn this girl fucking is cool so fuck kind of took me under her wing that night and was like really good to me and I was like fuck like I really like this girl like I get why he cheated on me with her I'm like mind you this guy had told me this girl was crazy in the past and I'm sitting here like this girl rolls actually me and him are obviously already broken up and him and her end up having like a big falling out at this time I had kind of forgotten she existed and I was already moved on to another man which per on one fine morning I wake up to a message from Mary asking if I'd ever let her give me cunnilingus and while I was very flattered <laughs> I was already in another situation like Mary no you cannot give me cunnilingus so I very politely decline but not before I get the opportunity to screenshot these messages send them to my ex-boyfriend and say yeah I stole your bitch he then went on a very expected posting rampage where he said bitches are crazy bitches are stupid bitches are wild blah 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 at the end of the night I got to rest soundly knowing that I had stolen his girl I will always put respect on Mary's name and she is my phlebotomist <laughs> Here's a little story time slash big sister advice on why you shouldn't use boric acid. For those of you who don't know what it is and could have fallen victim to this, um, it's a suppository that you stick in your hoo-ha. It's said to regulate your pH and make your stinky stinker tin not stink so bad. People also take it when they do the nasty or like they just get off their period and they feel like they just need a little refresher. So I had done the nasty, right? And I was taking it because I was like, I just need a little refresher probably. I was not due for my period for three more weeks. And I'm very regular with my period. Like I get it on the same day of every single month at the same time for the same amount of days. And the day after I took it, I start bleeding and I'm thinking, 
thinking to myself, oh my fucking God, this is fertilization bleeding, I am pregnant. I was literally Googling every single reason I might be bleeding three weeks early, like ovulation, right? Like cysts, like pregnancy. But I don't bleed when I ovulate, I don't have cysts, and I was really hoping to God that I wasn't pregnant. Not that I wouldn't be an amazing mother, <laughs> but I'm. it's not for me right now. Once I had been bleeding for about three days, I'd ruled out pregnancy. And it took a lot of research to find out that boric acid has an effect on most women that makes them get their period early. And this isn't really your period. Like your cycle is still in its cycle. It's very dangerous, okay? They use it to like kill bugs, I'm pretty sure. If you feel like you're stanking down there and you might have BV, please go to a doctor because that can cause cervical cancer if you let it go for too long. And if you just need a refresher, just chug a bunch of cranberry juice. Please don't fall victim to these suppositories that are meant to change your life because they don't change your life. Okay, love you, bye. Here's a story time of how I bailed my mother out of jail. You heard me, you heard me right. Uh, my mama sits uh, my madre. <laughs> so I just love the story times about my mother and me too, because she is a case study. My mother is the sweetest, funniest person on earth, right? But under the surface, right, you dig in there. She's a little bit nuts and I love it. A few years back, my mom decided it was part of her journey um, that she was gonna have like a little mental breakdown. Uh, maybe she didn't decide, maybe it just happened. That was a joke. She definitely didn't choose this. She definitely did not choose this. Basically my mom has bipolar, right? So she is fun and fresh and funky and sometimes she has mania. Before she was on meds, she would also have a little bit of psychosis, which was a whole other story. It was a fun, fun time for me. Just kidding, it was scary. Similar to me because you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, she does like to get a little punchy. We've both grown. This situation definitely taught us both something that we needed to learn a long time ago. But my mom basically decided she was gonna get punchy with a girl that punched her first, which is completely fair in my opinion. This did happen to be during one of her manic episodes where she was having a little bit of psychosis, so she didn't call the police, um, but she did give the girl a dirt nap. Once my mom had been on meds for a while, she was like, OMG, like just remembered, like I do have a warrant out for my arrest. I should probably take care of that. And I was kind of like, warrant out for your arrest, same, um, but you should really take care of that. This is not something that's normal for my mom. My mom had never Never been in legal trouble in her life so we could not find the jail we eventually find it after two days we went twice trying to find this place we're crying like i'm never gonna see her again mind you she's gonna spend one night there and then i just have to come get her but we are sobbing we're sobbing okay she goes in she gets her picture taken she slays the picture my mom's mugshot was hot good job i think if i had a mugshot i would make it my profile picture but that's just me next day comes around and it's time to bail her out and she literally calls me like she'd been in there for 40 years like she feels institutionalized Did you at this time i didn't have a license because um it had been suspended for three years and i couldn't renew it like i said apple tree right apple tree it also happened to be my best friend slash brother's birthday and he had called me asking to hang out and i was kind of like oh yeah mom's in jail we just have to like bail her out and then we can all get like like dinner he's like oh mom's in jail like okay we can bail her out completely normal right he lived with us this is completely normal to him at this point so i pick up shaquan and we're on our way but i tell him like you know i don't have a license like you have to go in there and bail mom out i think any normal person would be like no like i don't want to get involved but that was my brother and my best friend so he's like oh slate like yeah sure hours pass and she doesn't come out and we're like where the hell is she like we can't call her and then we get a call from my grandmother and she's like oh your mom walked all the way here like she's home slay so we go to pick up my mom <laughs> she is institutionalized you would think this woman had been in there for 45 years for criminal arson like literally but then she saw Shaquan and she was like my son like you bailed me out of jail like thank you so much and then we literally went and got food because it was just like over with like done then we just continued life like a little quick criminal slay and then we went about our day or whatever Dr. Seuss said you know what I mean so my mother has lived a thousand lives she should really write a book um love her so much am I the asshole for calling my sister out on her favoritism I, 34 male, have an older sister, Tina. Tina had extreme fertility issues, suffered through many miscarriages, and endured a premature stillborn. I went to countless therapy sessions with her and a cemetery with her, year after year, completely supportive of her. Towards her late 20s, she gave up trying being, being told she wouldn't be able to conceive and carry to term. She adopted my two nieces, two sisters who were toddlers at the time. Then, six years ago, my sister miraculously conceived and carried to almost full term. She almost lost her during a traumatic <coughs> premature birth, but she spent a few days in NICU and is five today. Obviously, we celebrated a lot. Everyone was overjoyed, gathered around to see my sister's miracle baby, but I assumed this form of attention towards the just the baby would calm over time, but it didn't. To this day, my youngest niece gets all the attention. She has hundreds of dolls, toy chests full, her own room, while her two sisters have to share. Dollhouses after dollhouses. She has a chest full of toys. Tina's adopted daughters have to share all their toys together. The youngest is in dance, and I watch my older nieces twice a week, so my sister can sit at her practices. The past few days, my sister told me that the youngest had a recital coming up, so practice was more frequent to watch the older two. 
I believed her until my friend saw Tina and the youngest at the arcade place. I asked my sister about this, and she confessed to lying and saying she wanted some quality time with her youngest. I told her she gets that all the time, and her two other daughters need quality time too, that they are with me more than her. She said I couldn't say that, and that her youngest had a busy lifestyle. I basically said, oh, really? Because it seems like favoritism. She got upset and said I had no right to say that because she was her miracle baby and that I wouldn't understand because I have no kids. She told me I needed to keep my opinions to myself because I know nothing. She dropped off my older nieces with me today again and said nothing to me the entire time. So am I the asshole? All right, without a doubt, you are not the asshole at all. What Tina is doing is not okay. And this is why a lot of adoptees on this platform specifically talk out against people using adoption as an infertility treatment. Meaning a lot of couples who are told they can't have children immediately dive into adoption, hoping that this adoption is going to fix all their problems. And of course it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. And what really messes this up is when you end up naturally conceiving. And then all of a sudden, like this, this person's sister, they have their miracle baby and their adopted children mean nothing to them. So not an asshole. Honestly, I would kind of start maybe a conversation on either going to therapy as a whole family or getting more guardianship over your two nieces because it sounds like they're kind of neglected. Not going to lie. Uh, your sister is the big asshole here, but I would love to hear what y'all think. These are my opinions and my opinions only. So is he the asshole? I'm the asshole. I ghosted my boyfriend of five years. I came over to his house one morning to surprise him with breakfast and a video game he wanted, only to find him naked, asleep, and with his ex curled up in his arms. He didn't hear me come in, so I closed the bedroom door, left his breakfast and game on the kitchen counter along with my key to his house. I, I, I would have taken everything with me, personally, but um, mm. that's fine. I went to my car, deactivated my Facebook, and blocked him on all forms of social media. I called my phone provider to change my number before driving off. I texted my family and close friends that we were no longer together and to block him on socials, oh but God. I didn't tell them why. I was in a position to end the lease of my apartment early, and I was starting a new job in a different city later that week. I completely removed myself from him and didn't offer a shred of explanation or opportunity of dialogue. I disappeared from his life after his betrayal, and I think it'll not only help me focus on myself without his presence, but I think completely shutting myself off from him will hurt him worse than anything when he thinks how good he had it with me for five years. I'm going to say not the arsehole, but I think the way they handled it was a bit unnecessarily extreme. The first one. I slept with my girlfriend's mum two years ago. Oh my god. Yeah, I struggled it up. <laughs> Even just from the title, I'm like, I'm I know. stressed. <laughs> I can't tell her because I know she'll dump me and it'll probably end her parents' marriage. Let's get into it. Okay. So first, let me say I'm not the one in the wrong, but I have to say it somewhere. It's eating me alive. Okay, fair enough. Two years ago, when I was 19, I met this woman while I was working as a personal trainer. She was in her 40s, but looked 25. She took an interest in me, invited me over a number of times, and we slept together a few times. Okay. After one of our meetups, she said it was wrong for someone her age to be with me because I was too young and she changed gyms. My okay. girlf... Interesting, interesting. We're off to a flying start. It's not going well. <laughs> My girlfriend and I have been together for just under a year. She's amazing and I love her very much. Oh. Two months ago, I met her family for the first time and I was shocked. Like, she took me to her house where I had, I had hooked up with this woman before and I felt I was being pranked. Oh, my God. I feel like this story could have been written with more suspense. Like, you already know where this is going. That's okay. That's okay. Well, I mean, from the title alone, like, we already know where this story yeah. is going. It's going to be juicy. So I'm just kind of keen to see how things play out. Before I see her mum, it hits me. I have a type and they definitely both fit that type. Oh my god. <laughs> no, 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 I feel like that was an unnecessary sentence. Well, I mean, they are also family, so... Oh. <laughs> I had been hooking up with a single mum and I'm now with her daughter. Oh. Then her mum and dad pop out and we both almost shit ourselves. <laughs> I'm reading this verbatim. I met her parents. They've been married for 20 years. And I realised I was a married woman's boy toy. Oh I'm god. so ashamed. Later that week, her mum finds my number and tells me I can never speak of what happened. She says my girlfriend will hate me forever and I will be the one to break up her parents' marriage. So now I'm stuck with this secret. 
She invited me to spend Thanksgiving with her family. And since my family's a thousand miles away, I already told her I don't plan on going home. So I don't have an excuse to not go. So now I'm going to have to sit there at a table enjoying Thanksgiving dinner with the woman I had an affair with, her husband, and their daughter who I'm in love with. I'm fucked. <laughs> Am I the asshole for logging into my friend's email account and declining her university offer of admission? Oh. I know. This is going to be juicy. My friend once told me her password on Gameplay, and so I remembered the same password and tried this for her email. Turns out it was the same password. So I logged in and I rejected her admission and logged out. My friend still doesn't know about this. What's what's your like first gut instinct? Mine is yes, they're an asshole. Yeah, I'm the same. That's I just think not cool. Based on the fact that they've invaded their friend's privacy alone, yeah, that is an asshole move, regardless of the reason why they did it. So the title of this one is, Am I the asshole for paying for a lounge at an airport during a long layover? I'm traveling with five friends now and we're traveling cheap. However, we had one long layover in an airport with a great VIP lounge. Mm -hmm. The thing about these lounges is that they have free food and liquor and comfortable chairs and shower facilities. I told my friends what I was about and they all said that they didn't want to waste money. So I went to the lounge by myself. They said, why I look so pleased with myself. I told them about my stay in the lounge. Two of them got visibly angry. They said I was an asshole for not telling everything there was in the lounge. Okay, quick fire reaction, not the asshole. Yeah. This is a really I'm sorry, interesting one. Friends of being an asshole. Yeah, this is a really interesting one because there's a lot of people who would be in the school of thought of, okay, well, if we're having a group trip, then we should all be on even playing field and be spending time together mm. and hanging out, yada yada yada. But then the other school of thought is, this person is also traveling. Everyone has their own money. That my husband confessed to me yesterday that he's in love with my sister in a drunken state. I don't know if I should take it seriously or if it's just a drunk thing. Yesterday, we had our dinner with my sister and her husband, and we all had a lot to drink. After my sister and her husband left, my husband and I had sex. Neither of us were tired, so we continued drinking a bit of wine, listening to music in the background, and everything was amazing, or so I thought. My husband was smiling and in a good mood. He's always like that when he's drunk. We talked about my sister and her husband. He just suddenly said, I'm so in love with sister's name. I said, what? He said, I'm so desperately in love with sister's name. What I would do to taste her lips. She's brilliant. He looked dreamy and was still smiling. I said, how drunk are you? He said, probably plenty. I was drunk too, but it still hit me like a ton of bricks. I just sat silent there and he too was in his own world with a smile etched on his face and he looked like he was a million miles away. This is when I went to bed. This morning, all the memories came rushing in and now that I'm not drunk, it hit me even more what he said. I'm horrified my heart is in pieces. He hasn't mentioned anything and is acting normal as if it's just another hangover. I don't know what to do now. He's always had a good relationship with my sister with mutual respect. Should I ignore his drunken comments? Was that him just being drunk? Should I wait for him to start talking? I'm not even sure what he remembers. And about the sex that we had, something was different. Even though I loved and thought it was the best sex of my life, he was different. Passionate, tender, and loving, and he kept saying, I love you. You're brilliant. P.S. My sister has always been modest and tomboyish, but she's lost 25 kilograms and has been working out for a year. She had a form-fitting red dress yesterday with red lips. She looked stunning and we all gave her compliments about it. Imagine going to Target to buy a present for your partner only for it to be the last time anyone would see you alive. On June 2nd, 2007, a newly graduated 18-year-old named Kelsey Smith left her home in Overland Park, Kansas for a quick trip to her local Target. She was on the hunt to buy her boyfriend a scrapbook for their six-month anniversary. Little did she know, someone else was also on the hunt. Kelsey never returned home and stopped answering her phone. People close to her grew worried and started looking around for her and checking for any car accidents. They found Kelsey's car in the mall across the street from the Target shopping center and called the police. She was nowhere to be found. Her car was towed to a crime lab for fingerprints and DNA while her parents and her boyfriend were questioned and cleared as suspects once their alibis checked out. This is when they obtained surveillance footage from Target. The video shows Kelsey entering the store, walking through the aisles, grabbing her things, and checking out and exiting into the parking lot. Then it shows her walking to her car, putting her things on the passenger side door, and then getting into the driver's side door. As they closely examined the footage, they noticed something strange. They noticed a man following Kelsey closely in the store while she was shopping and following her to the parking lot after she checked out. From the blurry footage from her in the parking lot, it looked like he approached her, forced her in the car, and drove off. Later, her car is parked at the mall and he exits the vehicle, leaving it there abandoned. His picture was quickly released to the public and tips came flooding in. On June 6th, just four days after she went missing, a tip came in about a man and where he resided. When taken to the police station, this man's name turned out to be Edwin Hall. 
Investigators show him a picture of Kelsey to gauge his reaction. He denies ever seeing her. That's when they show him the footage of him inside Target. He states that he was there, but he never saw her. He offers up DNA, fingerprints, and anything else he could to help eliminate himself, which surprised investigators. When pressed further, Hall finally admits that he did see her and that she had great legs. This creeped them out and sent shivers up their spines. Finally, a break came when a local waitress reached out, stating that Hall was the same individual who had harassed her and skipped out without paying. Because of this, they were able to book him for the restaurant theft. Around this time, Kelsey's phone records became available and her last ping location shows her in the wooded area known as Longview Lake. This is when investigators search the area and unfortunately, they make a horrifying discovery. A nude woman fitting her description is found under a pile of branches, deceased with a nylon belt wrapped around her neck. DNA testing later confirmed everyone's worst fears. The victim was Kelsey. The examination of her body would reveal Kelsey Smith's dreadful and gruesome last moments. Crime Fanatic Friday Part 2, Kelsey Smith. After DNA testing confirmed the new body of the woman found in the woods was Kelsey Smith, further examination done revealed the sickening truth. She had been assaulted, sodomized, and strangled with her own belt. A thumbprint from the driver's side belt buckle in Kelsey's car was a match for Hall's fingerprint. Her DNA was also found on a stain inside the zipper flap of Hall's shorts. The chance that it could have been anyone but Smith's was 1 in 280 billion. Edwin Hall was then charged for her murder as well as her rape and sodomy. 18 months later, the trial began and Hall pleaded guilty to all charges to avoid the death penalty and also waived his appeal rights. During the trial, Hall admitted to liking Kelsey's legs and thinking that she looked like a 12-year-old, which is why he chose her. He admitted to following Kelsey to her car, running up to her when she opened the driver's door, and forced her inside by pointing an air gun to the back of her head. From Target, he took her to Longview Lake and committed the horrible acts to her while she was alive. Defensive wounds showed that Kelsey fought for her life. The afternoon Kelsey disappeared, a couple stated that they saw a man carrying a blue duffel bag exiting the wooded area and walking to a black pickup that had several wooden sticks stripped of branches and leaves in the back. On September 16, 2008, Edwin Hall was sentenced to life without parole for the murder of Kelsey Smith. He stated in court, I can't find the right words to say today. I am so sorry for what I have done. That's it. That's all I can say. The 47-year-old currently remains in prison at the Hutchinson Correctional Facility serving out his life sentence. Since her death, Smith's family has started the Kelsey Smith Foundation to carry on her legacy. The goal is to educate young adults on how to avoid becoming crime victims. Am I in the wrong for wanting to divorce my husband because he wants a son? I, 27 female, have been with my husband, 29 male, for five years, married for three of those years. Our marriage was perfect and we were so happy. It felt like our entire life was perfect. Church on Sunday, loving husband, beautiful home, all of it. A few months into our marriage, I became pregnant and my husband and I were overjoyed and so was the rest of our family. My husband was especially happy after finding out that our baby was a boy as he'd always told me he wanted at least one son. I even started to try to attempt to repair my relationship with my mother so our son could have a relationship with his grandparents. I had originally cut off most contact with my mother due to how she treated my brother when he married his husband. Though my brother said he was alright with my decision to try to get her back in my life since he still has love for her and my baby was her first grandchild. However, our son ended up being stillborn and it broke me. I fell into a depression and even at one point considered taking my life, but my husband was there for me through all of it and we got through the grief. Our marriage felt stronger than ever and life started slowly feeling beautiful again, even if it no longer felt perfect. About five months ago, I found out that I'm pregnant again and then found out soon after that we're having triplets. My husband and I were over the moon and he was the most doting and loving husband. Since we've always said that we wanted two to three children, we agreed that we wouldn't try for any more children after this. Because of our and our family's excitement for triplets, we decided to throw a baby shower and a gender reveal party. We trusted my brother with the genders of the triplets and he bought some confetti cannons with the colored streamers inside. The baby shower went wonderful with my parents, in-laws, my brother and his husband, and their daughter, and tons of friends and extended family. It was like a dream come true and I was so excited for the gender reveal. I don't care what the gender of our babies was, I just wanted healthy little babies, but my husband was clearly excited for potentially three sons. When the time came, me, my husband, and my brother all shot a confetti cannon and all three shots came out pink. I was so excited and so was my brother when my husband screamed at the top of his lungs and hit the table in front of us, hitting it so hard that it actually broke. He screamed at me that I was supposed to give him at least one son because I killed his first one. That's when I burst into tears. I had been so broken up about our son's stillbirth and part of me had felt it was my fault. And now he, my husband was, the love of my life, telling me that it was. My brother immediately stepped in and tried to get my husband to calm down, but my husband shoved my brother. So my brother instead pulled me inside where I cried in the living room while my husband's mother tried to calm him down. I could hear him screaming outside about how three daughters is too many, how he doesn't want four kids but he also wants a son. Ever since that moment, my husband has hardly talked to me. He's been sleeping in the guest bedroom and when we do interact, he's clearly upset and mad and tries to argue with me. I try to talk to him about it and ask how he'll be with our three daughters, but he spat at me and told me that he'll provide them with shelter and food but he isn't interested in daughters and doesn't plan to have a close relationship with them. That sealed the deal that I want to divorce him and I cried myself to sleep last night. Earlier today, I confided in my mother and my mother-in-law about all of this and they told me that I can't divorce my husband just because he wants a son. I don't want my daughters to grow up in an unloving household where their parents constantly argue and their father doesn't love them. The moment my husband said I killed our son, I felt as though I lost all the love I had for him in an instant, and I don't want my daughters to be in that kind of household. However, both mom and mother-in-law say it's just natural for men to want sons and that at least he isn't saying he'll mistreat them. They treated this as an absolute fact and acted as though I'm just being a silly little girl who doesn't know anything. 
I felt incredibly small and stupid. I don't know what to do. My mother and mother-in-law make me feel like I'm maybe overreacting to my husband's behavior. But my brother says that this is not normal as he and his husband are both men who absolutely love their daughter. I'm also not sure what I'll do with myself if I divorce my husband. I don't work and I'm not sure how I'll be able to find a job that can support me and three babies all on my own. Or how I'll make time for all of them when I have to work. I feel so lost and helpless. I'm torn on what to do because I worry divorce will be too harsh of a decision and that maybe my mother and mother-in-law are right. Am I in the wrong? What should I do? Am I the asshole for no longer letting my mother-in-law watch my daughter after she kept on throwing away the food I sent? I'm a widower and have a six-year-old daughter who's a very picky eater and got worse after her mother's passing. She loves her mother's cooking and refused to eat anything that isn't made by her mother. I decided to learn how to cook her favourite meals that my wife used to cook and my daughter has been loving my version of her mother's cooking. I recently started working a new job and my mother-in-law started watching my daughter three days a week. I have my sister helping, so I'm doing good. I prepare meals for my daughter to take with her to her grandparents' house and my mother-in-law won't have to worry about what my daughter can and cannot eat. My mother-in-law complained about the meals I send and said I needed to encourage my daughter to eat from a variety of dishes. I already explained how my daughter is when it comes to food and that I'm already learning new dishes every week so it's not repetitive. So last week I discovered that my daughter has been eating only snacks for days at her grandparents' house. She told me this and I was confused. I asked about the meals I send with her and she said grandma would take them from her once I leave, throw them in the trash can and then tell her to eat the dishes she makes. My daughter refused and has been only eating snacks at that house. I was enraged I confronted my mother-in-law and she said that she didn't find me sending meals with my daughter was the right thing to do and wanted her granddaughter to eat her cooking and was upset that she refused. She said it's my fault her granddaughter doesn't want to eat certain foods and that I was spoiling her rotten with this behaviour. I mentioned to her that the meals she threw away were my wife's recipes and that I struggled so hard to provide those meals, as well as taking time to learn how to cook them. She stated I wasn't doing a good job parenting and needed to get a grip because she's feeling concerned about how spoiled my daughter is because of me. I eventually told her I won't let her watch my daughter from now on and decided to ask my sister for help. Father-in-law and sister-in-law kept calling me cruel for not letting them see their granddaughter and father-in-law said that I overreacted and promised to convince his wife to let my daughter eat what she wants as long as she visits. But I refuse to discuss it right now because I don't really take what they say at face value. Okay, so all of Reddit decided that the dad wasn't the asshole in this case. However, I do think there was a conversation to have been had by everybody in a bit more of a grown-up way because I don't know what the food is. The mother-in-law might have been right. It might not have been nutritional, but at the same time, she doesn't get to make that decision. So, bit of a difficult one. Am I the asshole for telling my sister it's her own fault her family is a mess because she wanted to adopt? Let's read. My sister Lucy has always wanted a big family. She and her husband Tom had their son Logan, but due to complications, Lucy couldn't have more kids. Lucy was devastated. About three years ago, she and Tom decided to adopt. Tom never outright said he didn't want to go through with it, but it was clear he didn't care one way or another and just wanted Lucy happy. Logan said he didn't want a sibling. Lucy brushed all over his concerns with the they'll get on board eventually attitude. Long story short, they eventually matched with a boy, Jack, who is now 11. Lucy said they all bonded, but Jack had behavioral issues, and whenever I saw them, I picked up on the fact that over time, Tom seemed to be getting less and less keen, and many times when it was just adults, he commented on his worry that Jack had latent issues because of his traumatic past. Lucy adores Jack and rubbished these concerns. I brought up Tom's hesitation, but Lucy said it was just taking longer for him to bond. They officially adopted Jack a year ago, and since then, things have fallen apart. Jack's behavioral has either gotten a lot worse, or Lucy wasn't speaking about it as much as before, but it's clear Tom is at his wit's end. According to Lucy, he works late constantly, and whenever Jack has a tantrum, he helps Lucy calm him down, and then takes Logan and leaves the house. Logan now hates Jack and won't play with him, which causes more issues, and he's starting to act out. He spent his last school holiday with my family and is set on to spend Christmas with us again because even the family therapist says it's good for him to have some space. Having seen all this unfold has been heartbreaking. Tom and Logan look more miserable every time I see them and though Lucy would never admit it, she does too. Whenever I speak to her, she talks about how hard it is but always has Tom and Logan at fault. She has never taken accountability for the fact that she didn't listen to anyone's concerns. 
She called me a couple days ago to discuss plans for Christmas and when Tom would be dropping Logan off at my home. She again started ranting about Tom, how he had basically shut down at home with her and Jack, and how she thinks he's going to leave. She was calling him every name in the book and then started saying she was disappointed that Logan doesn't love Jack and she can't believe she raised a bully. I lost it. I told her really the bully was her. She bullied her family into adoption as some form of wish fulfillment and tom shouldn't have indulged her but most of the blame falls on her for destroying her family she screamed and cried and eventually called me evil and hung up my parents are now saying i was the asshole for telling her that even though we all think it but i think she needed to hear it and stop blaming her own child for being unhappy living in the chaos she created edit for everyone saying i said or implied that tom is blameless i didn't i said to lucy that tom shares the blame but i do think most of it lies with her who I don't think has any blame, no matter how hard she's tried to place it on him, is Logan. So, is she the asshole? Alright, in my opinion, in this story, the two biggest assholes are definitely Tom and then Lucy as well. Because, one, if your partner is not wanting to go into adoption, and even if he's not, like, totally against it, but not totally for it, that's a, usually a pretty good sign that, hey, maybe we shouldn't approach adoption. If your child is telling you, I don't want a sibling... That's a really good reason to listen to them. It's also recommended to adopt younger than your biological child. So the fact that Logan is only nine and their adopted son is 11, you shouldn't have done that to begin with. I feel sorry that Lucy wasn't able to have the big family she envisioned, but going through adoption when your whole family is not entirely in it is for the wrong reason and you put jack in a horrible situation that honestly should have and could have been avoided so i don't think the sister is necessarily the asshole um i think that the entire family should go through therapy at the very least and there were some comments saying like oh they should just give up jack they legally adopted him you don't do that at all which is why you also don't go into adoption unless everyone is on board and everyone meaning the parents the siblings like literally everyone in that household so the whole like she did adoption even though some of the family wasn't into it doesn't sit right with me but those are my thoughts and my thoughts alone what do y'all think am i the asshole for selling my ex fiance's family early when he wouldn't pay me back for our cancelled wedding i 27 female was supposed to get married to my ex fiance mason 29 male on the 20th of this month but last week, a mutual friend caught him cheating with his ex, Kim, so I called it off. Because it's so close to our wedding day, I had already booked everything like the venue, catering, and everything else. I barely managed to get any money back as it's mostly non-refundable, so in total I've lost $20,000. Last year, I took out a loan to cover the costs of the wedding. The longer I take to repay it, the more the interest it gets. When we first got engaged, Mason agreed to sharing our finances together, meaning had we got married, I would have been able to pay it off. This was supposed to be in our prenup, but because we didn't get married, it meant he no longer had to share finances. I asked him if he was still willing to help, and told him that I will go into debt if he doesn't as I can't repay it alone. He told me, it isn't my problem, you took out a loan you can't pay back, and stopped responding after that. When we got engaged, Mason proposed to me with a family heirloom ring belonging to his great-grandmother that was worth $25,000. When we cancelled the wedding, he told me he wanted the ring back, but we never got round to arranging a time he could pick it up. Because I don't want to go into debt, I told him that if he didn't agree to help pay it off, I wanted a lawyer involved and that I would sell the ring. However, he didn't reply and ignored the messages. Uh, however, after talking to a mutual friend, Jake, I found out that he had actually read the messages and told everyone he didn't care because I wouldn't do it. I asked Jake to tell Mason that if I don't get a message from him in the next 24 hours that I would sell the ring. Jake told me again that he said he didn't care and he didn't think I would do it. So the next day I sold the ring to an online website and messaged Mason to tell him it had been done and he shouldn't have underestimated me. He started cussing me out saying I didn't scare him and that he would be around for the ring later. True to his word, he came by to my house demanding the ring and I told him I sold it already and I showed him the proof. He blew up at me saying I was a petty bitch and that I shouldn't have sold it because it wasn't just a ring, it was an heirloom that meant a lot to his family. A lot of my family members think I overreacted and shouldn't have gone to extreme measures as it will be hard for him to get the ring back, if he can at all. Am I the arsehole for selling his great grandmother's ring? Hi dear Mason, Jesus don't prosper. If you wanted the ring it should have been the first thing you did after the wedding was cancelled. Oh dear, poor Mason. My 23 female boyfriend, 22 male, doesn't trim slash shave. Advice? 
Hi. Like the title says, my boyfriend doesn't trim slash shave his Wait. area, and it's bothering me. We've only been dating a month, so I don't know how to approach this while being sensitive on the topic. Whenever I give him... Wink. It's uncomfortable for me because of all the hair. Any advice on how to approach this? I'm not trying to hurt his feelings. Any advice is welcomed. Wow, that's a tough one. I know. Ah, (laughs) I think I would just be super nice and get him manscaped for Christmas and um, two birds, one stone. Yeah. (laughs) With a light. Am I the asshole for switching to regular milk to prove my lactose intolerant roommate keeps stealing from me? Disclaimer, this is not my story. I share an apartment with two other guys. We split all the bills. We don't split the cost of groceries. Everyone's in charge of buying their own food and we don't touch whatever doesn't belong to us in the fridge. We put our names on everything so nothing gets mixed up. One of my roommates, Ray, keeps stealing my food. I get home from work and containers with my leftovers are sometimes missing or my stuff finishes too quick. I buy almond milk because I like the taste, but it seems to finish after a week even though I've only drank it once or twice. I confronted him about it many times and that's caused lots of arguments. He denies it and tells me I'm crazy even though it's obvious. Other roommate and I carpool together because we work the same early morning shift around the same area so I know it's not him. It's always after Ray's left for work that I notice my food is gone. Am I the asshole for switching to regular milk to prove my lactose intolerant roommate keeps stealing from me? Disclaimer, this is not my story. My roommate has a similar problem, but not as often as I do. Ray buys a lot for himself and is even more stingy about his food. He points out what's his when he comes back from the grocery store and tells us not to touch it. Last week, my milk was nearly empty again, so I got fed up. I went to the liquor store and bought regular dairy milk. I drank what was left of the almond milk and refilled it with the regular milk. The next day, we got back from work and Ray was pissed. He yelled at me that he was stuck in the bathroom for 40 minutes because of my milk. He said he was using it to make a shake. I said, so then you're the one who's been stealing. He admitted he was sometimes drinking my milk and eating my food, but he was more mad that I switched milks than the fact that he was caught. I told him I wouldn't have done it if he would have just stopped taking my stuff from the fridge or at least told the truth. My roommate backed me up. Am I the asshole for emasculating my husband and refusing to make my parents apologize for it? Disclaimer, this is not my story. My husband, 29 male, and I, 28 female, have been married for five years. My husband was a nurse until he told me he wanted to become a doctor. I was fully supportive and he is now in his first year of medical school. I have been supporting the both of us since he can't work while in school. Recently I found out our rent was being raised by $500 at the end of our contract in April. That will push us past where we are financially comfortable. So I brought up the idea of buying a home. We have talked about it before and he always said we could after he paid off his school debt from nursing which we did in 2020. I talked with my real estate agent mother who said it would be better to pay mortgage than rent. I brought this up to my husband and he shut it down. He told me our agreement was to wait until he paid off all his debt. I told him that was for nursing and some doctors don't pay off their debt for 20 plus years. Also that I have been supportive of his career and financially. I'm the asshole for emasculating my husband and refusing to make my parents apologize for it. Disclaimer, this is not my story. I said it was the best financial decision for us and it would relieve the burden for me. I brought up the savings we had for a deposit and that we could afford something small and modest. He said it was in our best interest to use that money to pay off his loans. Also that it was temporary and eventually he'd make more money than me so it would be even. My mother called to talk about looking into buying a house. I told her we weren't we would be looking for somewhere cheaper. She said we should consider it then asked if it was because of a deposit. Explained to her the conversation my husband and I had. Later my parents came over for lunch. They offered to gift us the deposit on a home. I was shocked by their offer once they left my husband exploded on me claiming I emasculated him and made him look bad. I told me we should take it as it would relieve so much financial burden on me refuses to talk to me or my parents until we apologize for shaming him. I apologize, but I told him I wouldn't make my parents because they've done nothing wrong. Am I the asshole? Try guys edition. Try guys, try cheating on their wives. Everybody's probably seen it by now. It's all over TikTok, it's all over Reddit, it's everywhere. But apparently Ned Fulmer, the guy that is literally known for being the family guy, for loving his wife, for being the best dad ever, he has cheated on the very lovely Ariel with Alexandria from the Food Babies. So the last couple of hours, everything but he's been like speculating because Ned got kicked out of the Try Guys. Try Guys issued a statement saying that they had decided to part ways with Ned. 
but radio silence from the Fulmers until we get to this message up here. And he has said, family should always have been my priority, but I lost focus and had a consensual workplace relationship. I'm pretty sure that your wife did not consent to you having that relationship. This is just sick. But at the same time, the whole response from Ariel just breaks your heart a little bit. Literally within minutes of Ned's post, Ariel made this post on her Instagram saying thanks to everybody who's reached out to me. It means a lot. Nothing's more important to me and Ned than our family. And we request right now is that you respect our privacy for the sake of our kids. I don't know about you, but it feels like she's going to take him back. And that is so heartbreaking because Ariel, you're a really nice person. You're a really nice person, girl, and you deserve better than this, than this very public humiliation. For the sake of your kids, dump that ass. Then take the house, take the kids, and most of all, take his money. Throw him out. He's trash. Throw him away. Say bye, Ned. Move on. Story time about how I accidentally discovered an online shrine of myself. When I was 18, I attended university and lived on campus. I made a few groups of friends to hang out with, including a new girlfriend. There was one class before lunch where it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards to eat in pairs or threes. One girl named Lily asked me if I wanted to eat lunch with her after class and I agreed. Over the next few weeks, this started becoming a pattern and I didn't exactly know how to say no. One day in that same class, someone asked if I could add them on social media. This happened in front of Lily and Organize I saw her face jerk towards Legos me from a couple seats over. It was such a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore. Later that day, I saw that Lily had sent me a friend request. We had no friends in common and I had no clue how she knew my last name, but I accepted it. She'd message me constantly and comment on anything I posted. Other than lunch, after class, and social media, we barely spent time together in person. She also made it clear that she didn't like my girlfriend, who was also coincidentally named Lily. She'd always make remarks about how she's the better Lily. On the last day of class, she asked me to go for a walk in the woods afterwards for lunch. While we were out there sitting on a log, she kissed me without warning. I got out of there as fast as I could, and I was happy I wouldn't see her for a while. However, she kept messaging me. Part 2 of how I accidentally discovered an online shrine of myself. Over the summer, I broke up with my girlfriend. When I came back to university, I started dating a boy. Lily wasn't pleased to hear this news. At this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. When I was scrolling one day, I noticed something odd on a blog I followed. I saw someone receive an ask with phrases that I recognized. I realized it was taken from my about page. This made me freeze. The person was asking this random person to analyze a section of text from my page, asking for their opinion on what type of person would write it. I went to the person's blog and I was shaken to my core. I could tell it was Lily's even though it didn't have her name or pictures on it. The content was primarily about me. There are accounts of things I'd recently done, references to things as far back as I'd known her, and basically twisted every platonic encounter we had to a romanticized version. She had gathered every scrap of information about me online and offline and posted it on this blog like a diary. There were also numerous posts attacking my boyfriend. She made up a whole fantasy world with all this information. However, it gets worse. Lily had an audience. She asked open questions about me and our relationship. Her followers were invested in this fake fanfiction version of my life. After seeing all this, I confronted Lily. Part 3 of how I accidentally discovered an online shrine of myself. I sent Lily a message confronting her about the blog. She said nothing. She didn't even address it, just changed the subject even after I pushed for answers. After this, she deleted the page or changed the name because I never found it again. I wasn't going to hang out with her anymore, but we still had classes and I was afraid of what she'd do next. She made sure to stay in my life the whole time I was at university. There was a time I pulled away from her and she started rumors about me and damaged a career opportunity I'd put a lot of work into. I let her stay in my life, but just ignored her. After graduation, Lily wanted me to spend time with her, but I knew I was done. I made excuses all the time and stopped posting on socials that she knew about. She didn't give up though. She somehow tracked me and messaged me occasionally referencing things that I mentioned online somewhere that she shouldn't have known about. The last conversation we had is when she messaged me out of the blue after months of not talking. She asked about how I knew I was queer and I told her basic stuff. She quickly changed the subject about how she wanted to be a boy for me and became fetishistic. It freaked me out and I stopped all contact after this. Later, I slowly deleted her from my inactive socials. I really thought that she might finally move on. However, a few days ago, she sent me a friend request. It's been 12 years since I first met her. I'm not accepting it. Crime Fanatic Friday, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was one of the most notorious criminals of the late 20th century. He was a serial killer, rapist, and necrophiliac known to have killed at least 36 women in the 1970s. 
From a young age, he liked to peer in people's windows and steal things he wanted from people. He attended the University of Washington where he fell in love with a wealthy and beautiful woman from California. However, after a year of dating, she broke his heart when he didn't measure up to her class or standards. This is when his switch was flipped and he changed his whole persona. He climbed the ranks in social circles and became well-known among the higher society and even politics. With his new status, he reached out to his ex and she was floored by how much she had changed. He seemingly rekindled their love all while plotting to break her the way that she broke him. Once she was his again and thought that they were to be engaged, he gave her the cold shoulder and rejected her over the phone. The same year, he started committing his first documented attacks on women, all who looked similar to his ex. He bludgeoned an 18-year-old student as she slept with a metal rod from her bed so badly that it resulted in mental disabilities. By the middle of the year, college students in the area were vanishing once a month. He confessed to 30 murders between 1974 and 1978, but the true number may be higher. He was executed for his crimes in the electric chair in 1989. Crime Fanatic Friday Part 2, Ted Bundy picked me up while I was hitchhiking. My friend and I were driving from Philly to Miami Beach when our car's block cracked down in North Carolina. It was around 1975 and I thought it would be an adventure to hitchhike the rest of the way. We got a ride from a guy in a station wagon to the border of South Carolina and parted ways. That's when a guy who was a spitting image of Ted Bundy stopped and asked us where we were going. When I said Miami, he asked what street. We were overjoyed this youngish guy was willing to take us straight to my mother's house in Bay Harbor. This was around the time that Bundy had his prison break in Colorado and was supposed to have moved to Florida. After we got in the car, he offered us a J. He didn't want any, but told us we should toke up. Well, whatever was in that J was powerful enough to almost paralyze both of us. That's when he started playing with buttons on the radio and compulsively switching stations. I began feeling paranoid because I could sense a weird aura from this guy. He stopped at a rest stop and disappeared for an hour. When he got back, he said we had a detour to his bank and started taking us through miles of small roads in Georgia. He stopped at a single building like an abandoned tavern. He got out and went behind this building. He came back and drove around for hours until we got to Jacksonville. That's when he dropped us off by a mall and told us there was a change of plans. Looking back on it now, I'm almost certain it was him. This is why you should be careful who you talk to online. When I was 15 and getting into my junior year, I created a Twitter account. I didn't tell anyone my username, including my family or friends. I also didn't upload any pictures or specify my exact location, and I put a different city than where I lived. I had around 30 followers, and I didn't follow many people. One evening in October, someone sent me a weird direct message. They had 200 followers, and the message read, Hi, I'm Rob, and I just turned 17. I wanted to know if you lived in the city because I'm moving there and I'm going to that high school soon. I'd like to make some new friends. I immediately thought something was wrong because nowhere in my profile did I list my actual town, but I remembered a tweet I made a few weeks ago about buses in which I mentioned my city. I was bored and he was polite, so we started talking. The discussion was mainly about high school teachers and cafeteria food. As it got later in the night, he started asking more personal questions like if I lived far from the school or if I was ever home alone. I never answered these questions because it was too shady for me. The next day, we talked again and started bonding. I developed feelings for him over the next few weeks. He was handsome and super kind, which was everything I needed after being bullied for so many years. We had a two-week vacation in October and at the end of it is when he finally told me that he would be attending my high school. I was so excited to finally meet him. Part 2 Why You Should Be Careful Who You Talk To Online He asked to pick a place to meet during the morning break on our first day back to school after break. I was so happy to meet him and told him to join me in the hall. However, when he realized people would be around, he said he'd rather meet me in an isolated place because he might not recognize me in a crowd. It was a good enough excuse for me and I told him to meet me in the third floor bathroom because we weren't allowed to stay there during breaks and no one would disturb us. In my head, it seemed a little creepy, but since we were in school, I was confident that nothing bad could happen. I dressed up and made myself really pretty and counted down the minutes till we met. When he arrived, it was him. He wasn't a catfish, but he looked a little older than 17. We talked and got along so well, and at the end of it, he asked me to go to lunch with him. I refused because I didn't have money and wouldn't let anyone pay for me. He seemed disappointed, but offered to walk me home after class. I told him I had to take the bus, but he could walk me there. This became a routine for another two months. One day, I complained about how lonely I'd be at home as everyone in my family was going to be out that day. I know it was reckless, but I thought I could trust him by this point. That evening, he walked me to the bus Stop. I waved goodbye and put my headphones in. Little did I know that my life was in danger. Part 3 of why you should be careful who you talk to online. When I got off, I had a weird gut feeling that someone was watching me. Since it was December, it was already dark by the time that I had gotten off the bus. I paused my music but kept my earphones in not to draw suspicion. It was silent in my suburban neighborhood, especially at night. That's when I heard footsteps behind me. I knew someone was following me. As quietly as possible, I reached for my keys in my pocket. As soon as I pulled them out, I ran. It was the best and fastest sprint of my life. I somehow managed to open and close the door before he could reach me. I deactivated the alarm and looked through the glass panel on the door. It wasn't a peephole but a whole window, so if someone wanted to see inside the house, they could. Standing there, looking at me with the creepiest face, was Rob. He followed me home, probably with a car, and I was paralyzed. We stared at each other for a minute before I ran to the kitchen to grab a knife. When I got back to the door, he was still there and started banging. I feared the glass would break, but it didn't. After five minutes, he stopped and went around the house banging on every shutter until he came back to the door. He looked angry, but my neighbor's car pulled in and he ran off, probably thinking it was my family. After this, he harassed me online, which finally made me delete my Twitter. No one even knew or heard of him, which is probably why he looked older. I never heard of him again, but I still wonder what could have happened that night. Am I the asshole for refusing to get my pregnant wife fruit snacks and demanding she would do more chores? My 29 male wife, 27 female, is 24 weeks pregnant and so far it has been a fairly easy pregnancy, according to her and her doctor, not making assumptions of course. 
I have done my best to be a good husband. I work full time, started doing all the chores, cooking, cleaning, pet care, and of course, tried my best to accommodate her cravings. She has been taking it easy and spends most of her day relaxing. She says she's never felt better. To be completely honest, I'm starting to get a little burnt out. I love my wife and I want her to be comfortable while pregnant, but working full time and doing 100% of the chores is very draining. I recently had two separate conversations asking if she'd be willing to do an 80-20 chore split instead, but both times she got offended. She says that it would stress her out and possibly harm the baby, which scared me. I don't want anything to happen to our baby, so of course I didn't push it. Yesterday morning, 2am, my wife woke me up and asked if I could go to the store for fruit snacks. She was craving them badly. I have made many late night runs, but this week has been so stressful for me. I worked overtime the entire weekend and a deadline is approaching. I told her I was sorry, but I really needed to rest. I was exhausted. She did not like this answer. First, she tried to beg more, but I kept saying no. This went on for a half hour. Then she started crying and telling me what a shit husband I was being. She also said she's scared to see me as a father if this is how selfish I am. I snapped at her. I told her I've been taking care of 100% of the responsibilities for the past six months. She's been sitting on her phone every single day and hasn't had to lift a finger. Then I said I was done doing 100% of the chores and we needed to have a more even split because I was losing hair from the stress. I will admit I had a tone and I was obviously irritated. This caused her to cry more and she kicked me out to the couch. This has caused a huge rift between us. She was pissed at me the entire day and locked me out of the bedroom tonight. My mother-in-law has texted me to call me an a-hole. They both said that the stress I am putting on my wife will hurt the baby, so now I feel super guilty. I need perspective. Am I the arsehole? Nah. Am I the arsehole for ditching my date at the restaurant? Before anyone thinks this is a fake, let me assure you I wish this was. I'm in shock. I, 26 male, who recently just went on a date with a 25 to 28 year old female last Tuesday. We met at the gym. I've had a crush on her for a while and finally struck up a conversation and asked her out. I booked us at a nice Korean restaurant that has Korean barbecue stations. So we sit at the bar and have a pleasant chat for a few minutes and then they tell us our table is ready. Then we go to our table and it's got a huge grill fire on it and she instantly asks what this is. How does anyone not know what Korean barbecue is? But I brushed it off and I explained to her and she was like, but why do we have to do all the work, lol? Yes, she said lol and ironically. Isn't that their job? I explained to her that that's what's fun about it, but we could always order off the a la carte menu if she didn't want a barbecue. But she said, just make them do it for us and insisted on calling the waitress over and asking her to put the meat on the grill and demanded to be served after it was ready. This elderly Korean lady had to shuffle between busy tables and come and flip the meat and serve our plates. But wait, it gets worse. So at this point, I'm super embarrassed and seeing red flags like crazy. I'm Indian, so I'm kind of used to the whole servant master attitude thing because it's a big deal in India, but I'm not a fan of it. And I thought it was super weird here in the States. But I wanted to see the date through to the end. And yes, shamelessly enough, I was hoping for some adult time. At the end of the meal, she asked for dessert. I agree and asked to see the menu. The waitress comes over and gives the menu and hands it to her. She then waits for her to leave and says, my God, this place is a nightmare. All these useless immigrants, she's white, come to the country and don't even work and eat up our tax dollars. Are they even legal? And she said it loudly enough that a nearby table of brown people in their 20s started giving her dirty looks and whispering to each other. She notices and goes, same goes for these, insert racist word for people of Pakistan. At this point, my jaw dropped. I'm Indian and she used this in front of me. She saw my expression and went, oh no, I, I don't mean Latinos, they're fine. I love Mexican food. So it seems she thinks that I was Latino. My birth country never actually came up as I speak with an American accent and she uses a racist word against my own countrymen in front of me. So we get dessert, I get up to use the bathroom, pay off the bill with a good tip and walk out the door. I left her there, I drove her and went back and blocked her number. Now I'm even thinking of switching gyms, but I'm just going to go in the morning. I don't know what I will say if I ever meet her again. 
am I the asshole for ditching my date without transport at the restaurant? So this guy goes into some further points to clarify his original post um, and I'm not going to read them out because you can see the original content on Reddit if you're interested and also it's quite clear he's definitely not the asshole in this case. I mean this girl. Am I the asshole for believing the housekeeper over my son? We hired a housekeeper that comes over several times a week to get the house clean since my husband and I are busy with work. We have two kids, Jeremy 16 and Rhea 14. Now Jeremy is a jokester, he likes pulling pranks on everyone in the house and that included the housekeeper. He did stuff like throw her purse, hide her wallet and got punished for it and then told not to do it again because our housekeeper almost quit and we didn't want that. Now onto the current situation. Some days ago I got a call from Jeremy while he was having friends over telling me he saw the housekeeper sneak one of my jewellery into her purse and asked me to come home immediately. I freaked out and tried to call my husband but he didn't pick up. I went home and was mad. I talked to the housekeeper and she denied putting anything in her purse. I demanded to see her purse and my jewellery was there. The housekeeper started swearing on her children that she didn't put it there and had no idea how it got there. I believed her and figured Jeremy had something to do with it given his history. I switched my attention towards him and had him explain to me exactly how he saw the housekeeper do it. He told me what he saw but a friend of his came forward and said that he saw Jeremy put the jewellery inside the lady's purse and was trying to get her in trouble. Jeremy yelled at his friend and then told me it was just one of his pranks but I was furious. I kicked the rest of his friends who covered for him out and I punished him hard and apologised to the housekeeper. My husband reacted unexpectedly after he heard and said that I was wrong for choosing to believe the housekeeper over our son, even though there was a witness. But he said his friend must have said this to get him in trouble or because the housekeeper paid him to side with her, which was shockingly absurd of him to say. He said I was not being a good mother and my first instinct is to always believe my son in whatever he says and to never ever question him in front of his friends like that. I'm confused. Did I mess up? Um, no, I don't think so. You're a great mum. Teach your kid a lesson. Did the right thing. Am I the asshole for calling my in-laws gold diggers for insisting to know how much my new job pays? I'm male 28 Canadian and my fiance, female 26, and her family are from Latin America. My mother and father-in-law found out about my new job and wanted to have a private conversation with me without my fiance, so they invited me to their house. They invited me into their guest room. My father-in-law asked me to leave my phone and keys at the dining table. They started talking about my new job. They had no idea how much I get paid and asked me to tell them about my salary, but I politely declined to tell them. They asked why. I just bluntly told them it was none of their business. Father-in-law chimed in saying, you're marrying my daughter, damn right it's my business, and kept on about making his daughter's future secure. I assured him that his daughter is in good hands, and besides, money isn't everything, and love and respect are what's important. Mother-in-law disagreed and said that money is an important factor, then gave examples of issues I'll have in my marriage if I'm not capable of providing for my family. I refused to tell them, but again assured them that I'm doing well financially, so no worries. Mother-in-law refused to drop it claimed I was being disrespectful by treating them like they were some strangers asking about how much I get paid and demanded I gave her a number. I got so annoyed and wanted to excuse myself to the bathroom but father-in-law got up and locked the door. I asked what the hell he was doing. He told me to calm down and that he'll unlock the door when this conversation is over. I blew the fuck up and told him that their behaviour is unacceptable and what I earn is none of their goddamn business then told them that only gold diggers behave like this and right then they were giving me huge red flags. Mother-in-law gasped loudly and father-in-law immediately unlocked the door and asked me to leave his house. I grabbed my phone and my keys and walked out. Mother-in-law had already called my fiancé and was crying saying I disrespected them in their house and called them gold diggers for just asking how I was doing with my new job. My fiancé was upset but I explained what her mum and dad did. She said I not only hurt her parents, but her, hurt her as well by calling them gold diggers and I owe them an apology, but I refuse to. I asked if she thought what her parents did was okay, but she reminded me that she's with me because she loves me whether I'm rich or poor and it doesn't matter what others think. 
My fiance never cared about money, nor acted materialistic. She works as a babysitter and is happy with it. She said that I needed to apologise for calling them gold diggers and hurting their feelings for being worried about us. Although I assured them I'm doing well financially and that should have been the end of it. But I guess I escalated, they escalated, and now I'm refusing to apologise. My relationship with them might suffer if I don't. Am I the asshole? This is why quick thinking could save your life. A few years ago, I lived in an old one-person flat. Every door in the flat had a lock and key. Strange things started happening around the flat. I had a feeling that something was off because food items from my fridge started disappearing before I had a chance to eat them and I had fine pillows for my couch on my floor. One night, I woke up around 1 in the morning and I was drenched in sweat. I didn't remember, but I was sure I had woken up from a nightmare. I decided to take a shower, so I put my phone in the bathroom for music, turned on the water, and started enjoying my shower. A few minutes in, I heard the door move. I never closed the door, but it never moved before. I looked at the shower curtain and saw a shadow against it. I looked at the reflection on my phone and could clearly see someone standing next to the shower curtain. My heart was pounding out of my chest and it took every ounce of my body not to scream in terror. Somehow, I managed to act like I didn't notice anything while silently taking the shower head off the holding and turning the water to the hottest setting. The water in that flat got extremely hot when cranked all the way up. A few seconds later, steam was raising and I felt the water burning my feet as it flowed into the drain. My fight or flight kicked in and I didn't care if this person saw me naked. That's when I turned around, ripped the shower curtain open, and held the shower head right at the person. It only gets crazier from here. Part 2 Why Quick Thinking Could Save Your Life When I sprayed the hot water from the shower head on the person, I immediately noticed it was a woman. She screamed in pain when the scalding water met her skin. I whacked her in the face with the shower head and jumped out of the shower. I ran to the door, taking the key out of the lock and locking it behind me so that she couldn't get out. A little while later, she started to bang on the door, but thankfully the door didn't give. I ran to the kitchen and called the police on my landline phone while simultaneously grabbing a large knife just for safety. I felt like my throat was closing up when I saw that it was missing and realized there was only one place that it could possibly be. Luckily, the police got there and arrested the woman who turned out to have been the former person living in the flat. She was evicted for not paying her rent for three months. Apparently, she made a copy of the key and came into the flat when I was at work and sometimes at night when I was asleep. It's possibly what woke me up in the first place that night, but I don't even want to think about it. After the police apprehended her, I found the knife in the bathroom. She had brought it into the bathroom with her and either the police disarmed her or she dropped it herself at some point. All I found out later from the police was that she wasn't right in the head. Ever since this incident, I always insist that the locks are changed whenever I move into a new place. 